Okay, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Chuck Reeves and this is uh, Practical Software Estimation. I got into estimating uh, mainly because my current client, I'm a freelance PHP developer, uh, we do a lot of analytical data on uh, products for Google AdWords and we come up with suggestible bids. So I really got into statistics and probability. Uh, being a freelancer, one of the things I have to do all the time is quote people for work and effort so that they'll know if they want to uh, work on the project or accept the bid. So I found a couple of resources on how to do this that were really geared towards project managers. So I wanted to talk a little bit um, about estimation from a developer's point of view and sort of what we can do. So the first question um, I normally get asked is why even estimate? We hear stories about Spotify, Google, they really don't have deadlines. Well, estimation is not just about meeting deadlines. It's about measuring effort. A lot of project managers or product owners are going to want to know if something is worth their time, money, and effort to build. The only way they're going to do that is with an estimation. Then the next question is, well, then why should I as a developer be estimating? Well, we're the ones that own the code. We're the ones building it. We're the ones designing it, coming up with the structures. We know what the effort's going to go into it. And also, uh, project managers themselves and product owners shouldn't really estimate. They have bias to them. Uh, very recently, uh, I'm going to bash up these guys' names because it's in Dutch, but two scientists, um, Menge Norgsten and Stein Brimstad, did a study where they put out estimates to a bunch of third-party uh, outsourcing companies. And what they found was if the outsourcing company knew what the budget was in terms of time, money, and effort, then their estimate would be biased to fit inside of that estimate right there. So if I came up and they said, I need this done in two weeks, the third party company would say, yeah, we can do it in two weeks, but really they needed six weeks to do it. That's why we should really be the ones estimating, which also proves a good point. If you have any inclination about how much budget or time is in, you probably shouldn't estimate because you're gonna be a little biased. After all, you probably know how much you make in an hour. So you get a kind of an idea on what you're fitting in. Now, what fascinates me is that uh, most developers, we can solve problems that are complex in scale. Yet when it comes to estimating, it's this magical, mystical art of what we're doing inside. So I'm gonna play a little sound clip, and I apologize, I have to play it on my phone, from uh, this guy, Chris Harchis, from uh, the podcast Dev Hell, which is pretty popular in the States. Hope you can all hear it. Estimate things. So I sit down and I figure out how long I think it would take me to do it. Then I double that time, and then I push it up to the next the next point on the time progression scale. The time progression scale starts off seconds, minutes, hours, days. So if I think something's gonna take me four hours to do, I will double it to eight, and I say it will take me eight days to get it all completely done, start to finish. And I'm usually right, because there are so many impediments. If you're doing it, if you're the only one doing it yourself, your schedule can be very accurate. Accurate. Once you have to involve other people, you might as well just make numbers up. You might as well say, I think it's going to take me blue days to get done. <laughs> well, I think Chris is talking about blue as in hex value for blue, so I guess 255 days to get done, but I don't, I don't think he's really going with that. But uh, the point he brings up is that when you have to involve other people, it gets a little complex. So I'm here to tell you it's really not if you all follow certain uh, tools that I'm going to present shortly. I was working on a project very recently where I needed another developer to come help me out and he was busy working on another project. This other project had a laundry list of items to do and no end in sight to it. So I sat down with the developer and we came up with a way of uh, figuring out how much each of these features is going to take in order to complete. And then we came up with a reliable estimate. We presented it to the client and when we were done, we actually found out we launched, we, we finished a day early. So you can do this with groups of people. The way we did it is requirements. Requirements are the key. So how many people here actually will gather requirements? I didn't think so. <laughs> um, what's interesting is this quote here is measure what is measurable, but make measurable what is not so from Galileo. What he's saying is if you have no idea what's going on, you need some information. You need to come up with what you're going to have to estimate on. After all, I know myself, um, I can set up a web server in 20 minutes to 45 minutes itself. That's just something I know. When we're estimating, we're finding a battle of uncertainty. So we gotta make certain what is not known in this case. So when I gather requirements, I look for some uh, key requirements. Now, this is mainly going for the English language. I'm not really fluent in French, but I hope you, uh, the point gets across right here. 
The first thing I look for uh, in a requirement is a wordy expression. Uh, managers tend to fluff up requirements. They come from a sales background. So they want to sell you the requirements. I tell managers, I don't care about the selling points of the requirements. I need to know the technical details. It can be as dry as possible right here. So in this case, we can see here our new contact form from the sales team to call or email potential leads. We're required of potential leads to provide the following contact information. First name, last name, email address, phone number. There's a lot of useless information in here. First off, it's a new contact form. It doesn't matter if it's new, old, indifferent. It's a contact form. We have to have it to go in there. The actors themselves, potential leads, yeah, that's kind of interesting, but it doesn't really matter. Anyone can fill out the contact form, so we can cut all that out. The next thing I look for is a misplaced modifier. Um, once again, this applies to the English language, but in this case, we have the contact form. We'll have fields for entering a valid first and last name, email address, and phone number. What's wrong here is the valid right here modifies first and last name. So this means we can enter an invalid email address or invalid phone number. So we try to clear it up right here. Um, Bracho Mark is really famous. Uh, he's an actor from the silent film errors of doing uh, misplaced modifiers to make them funny. This one I found recently on Twitter. Uh, pro tip, prevent children from ingesting dangerous medicines by locking them in a child-proof cupboard. Three children per cupboard is good fit. That's right there is a misplaced modifier. So what we want to do is we kind of want to shift it around right here. So in the end, we'll have something like this. The contact form has fields for email address, phone number, and first and last name, and all the fields are required. Now what's interesting is all these up here are valid phone numbers. So when I see words like valid, I call them requirement smells. Much like code smells, to me, they're parts of the requirement that need to be clarified, need to be uh, reduced their ambiguity, pardon me. So for instance here, I can enter 911, that's help in the United States. 555-1212 is information. All these numbers up here are valid. So someone can fill in 911 and then I'll call them up to make a sales pitch. No, it doesn't really work that way. Um, so here's a list of, uh, I got from Software Requirements 2 by Carl Wiegers. It's a book, I'll have the ISBN for everyone at the end of the show. But when I see these, uh, I took this list right here because I love it right here. But if I see fast, rapid, efficient, I'm gonna wanna clarify that out. Use set time periods. What is fast? Is fast five seconds? Is fast three seconds? Is fast 30 seconds? 30 milliseconds? It's all relative time. Valid, including to, but not limited, et cetera. When I see et cetera, I want a comprehensive list and so on. So we want to come up with what our edge cases are going to be. Do we want letters in our phone numbers? Do we want to support outside countries, international phone numbers, toll-free numbers, all those? Maximize, optimize, at least between several. Define the boundaries for it. If something's supposed to be between five and six, say that in a requirement. Don't just say, oh, well, it's gotta be, you know, whatever it has to be. Uh, simple, easy, quick, and user-friendly. These are my favorite. Um, can anyone tell me what user-friendly is? Yeah, okay, I think so. I'll always love user-friendly. Yeah, so tell me what the hell that is, please. Reasonable and when necessary. I only saw this in a requirement once and I asked, well, what is reasonable? So we have to come up with a better way of doing it. So. Now that we have some more details, we can see here in our contact form, we, all of our encoding is going to be UTF-8. We've got to make sure our character limits for email addresses and phone numbers, first name and last name, what it's going to be. And uh, I bring this up as an example here, but in our contact form, let's say we have the phone number has to be less than 25 characters and validated with a REST service that we have to check out the phone number. So this is interesting. What can we do to come up, we've never used this REST service before, so what can we use to come up with our estimation? Well, there are three tools that I normally use, which we'll go over right now. Uh, the first one is historical data. You're gonna see this all the time when you're talking about estimating. You'll see it in all the books themselves. Case in point, who here commutes to an office for work? Anyone? How long, if you were going to work tomorrow, would it take you to get there? Um, from my home? Yes. Two hours and Two, minutes. two hours and 15 minutes. Well, that's an estimate right there. You're not actually going to work tomorrow. Tomorrow's a future event, and you just estimate it will take you two hours and 15 minutes. How'd you come up with that number? Because I do it every day. <laughs> exactly. So you can see right here the power of historical data. Now, what you can do with historical data is very interesting. Uh, normally, what I do is I have a git commit that will run every hour in a cron script, so that this way I can use GitHub to figure out how many lines of code I write per hour. And then I can break it down per how many lines of code I have per function, per method, per 
<laughs> it's okay. Per story point, and then I can get it a gauge on how fast I'm going. This is normally referred to as a velocity inside of agile development, but it's really more of a, I don't use velocity itself as an estimating factor. I just get an idea of how much actual work I can do in a given time period. Second one I like to use is a dry run or unit testing. Now, you don't have to use a full stack unit testing framework. Uh, most of the time, I just pull up a simple PHP page and I run through all my testing. Case in point, very recently, I had to do a lot of work with the Google's AdWords API, and they're sh shipping over to shopping campaigns, and I had no idea what was going on with it. There was no documentation. It was very weak on it. So I just came up with a simple page called Test PHP. I had it connect to Google, and I'm running all my tests to try to see what I need to do to get inside of my estimate. When I was done, I was able to say, okay, this is going to take me two to three weeks to do, and currently I'm ahead of schedule by a week and a half. So dry runs are a very powerful tool right there. The last one is the confidence interval. This is a statistic measure of uncertainty. Every statistician is going to use it, and you actually have exposure to it already. Um, most of the time when you see a weather report, they're going to tell you a high and a low. It's a range of numbers. So if they say it's going to be between, uh, well, let's say, uh, I don't know Celsius that well, so let's say it's between uh, 15 and 20 degrees outside, we know that the true value falls within that range, and that's what we're looking for. Using the confidence interval is great. It's going to uh, set up expectations that we're not certain where it is, but we know it's going to be between these values right here. And John Minuchies said it best, it's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. <laughs> this is very interesting. If you look at the recent 2008 crash, a lot of people quote this because they were using derivatives and they were precisely wrong. And that's one of the reasons why the market really crashed. So now I'm going to go through a couple of estimating questions here, and we're going to talk about what we can do to try to improve our ranges here using some of the information that we have in front of us. So the first three questions right here will be range-based questions. We want to know what the range is. So what is the wingspan of a 747? Think to yourselves right now, what would the range be? And I have the answer both in feet and meters as well, too, so you don't have to worry about that. And the last three are true or false questions right here. So we'll take a moment just to take a quick look at these. Uh, with the wingspan of 747, how far is New York from LA? The average hours, uh, excuse me, the average house in the United States uses how many gallons or liters of water per year? So now that you guys have estimates in your head, let's see what we can do to try to improve it. And there are four main ways that we can do this here. The first one is repetition. Now, we don't have enough time to do repetition because you really want to give yourself an hour or so break, go to lunch, maybe estimate it again the next day or later in the evening. But the idea is, is that you've had time to stew on the data and information and come up with a little bit of a buffer estimate right there. I use this sometimes if I'm on a tight deadline, though it really doesn't uh, provide that uh, much usability inside of it. The next is pros and cons. And what this does, it helps clarify your requirements a little bit more, but it also helps remove your bias. What you want to do is start listing out what will happen, uh, what good things will happen if your estimate is right, and what bad things will happen if your estimate is wrong. So for instance, if we're estimating our FUBAR REST service that I mentioned before, if we don't meet our estimate in time and we can't deliver the feature, well then we don't have valid phone numbers and we may be wasting time of the sales team to call back potential leads. But if we make our estimate on time, then we'll go ahead and save the company X amount of dollars inside of it. Absurdity test is my favorite one. This one is really fun as well too, because you can get really, uh, crazy with it. This is where you start with insane ranges and then you try to narrow them down. So for instance, with the 747 and the wingspan, I can say that, yeah, sure, the wingspan is between one meter and a thousand meters. That's one kilometer right there. That's a little absurd, but we know that the true value is in there at some point. But then what we want to do is start narrowing it down. So let's say, okay, let's try 10 and 100 meters. Does that sound a little bit better? Sure. Or we can get even further down, let's say between 50 and 80 meters. So that, that's one of the nice things that we could do inside of the absurdity test. And once again, you get really fun inside of it. I could say it took a million years to do, and yeah, sure, the true estimate is inside of it. And the last one is the equivalent bet. Now this one takes a little bit more, uh, this is a little bit more complex, and you kind of need someone else to work with it as well. But the idea is this. You have two choices. The estimate that you just made, or spinning of a wheel. The wheel has a 90% chance to win. If you win, you get $1,000 on the, on the wheel. However, if you, get, if you choose option A, which is your estimate, and you get the value right, you get $1,000 that way. You have 10% chance of losing with the wheel. And your estimate, you have whatever you feel is right there. 
So now how many people, based on what I just said, would actually choose to spin the wheel side of it? Anyone? Everyone's going to go with their own estimate for the 747? I, got, I see one guy shake his head up there. Will you take the spin of the wheel? Yeah, maybe. Maybe? Okay, that's actually a good answer. We don't want either or. We want to be like him. We don't want to know what our answer is going to be. Because now we feel that, okay, if we go with the wheel, then we're underconfident in our estimate. So we need to try again and refine it a little bit more. But if we go with our estimate, we might be a little overconfident. We want to be on the edge of the equivalent of the spinning the wheel and our estimate with the equivalent bet. So this way we know, okay, either or, we're probably going to win at some point. So now here are the answers in case anyone was wondering right there. Uh, did anyone get any of these right or wrong? We had 64 meters for the wingspan of 747. Was anyone really off on that? Everyone's good. I normally have like two or three people who have really off numbers right there. What about the water per day? Wow. One was really good. Okay. Another fun tool that we can use to estimate is called fuzzy logic or t-shirt analysis right here. And this is very simple. We take, the si we take our feature and then we give it a t-shirt size. And now these right here are industry standards, but of course if you have your historical data, you can actually tie these up together. Most project management or bug tracking systems allow you to attach custom data to it. So you can actually set these up inside of it and you can say, okay, this feature was considered large and it was 8,000 lines of code. So 1,100 lines of code may not be the best bet right here. So with our Foobar REST service, does anyone have a rough idea of what that would take in terms of a t-shirt size? Anyone? Come up there. Small. 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 So we're going to consider around 253 lines of code right there. So now we know, okay, it's 253 lines of code. That's going to take me four hours to do. So I'm going to be in that range of about four hours right there. The next tool we use in a group, this is great for a group setting. You need at least three people to do this. Is called Wideband Delphi. And what this does is everyone comes up with a feature and they write it down their estimate on an index card hand it off to the project manager. The project manager will then compile data. As you can see here, oh, I'm missing one at the top, but we have four developers in different rounds coming up with an estimate. Actually, the fourth developer got it right on the third one. So we can see here, after each round, we're gonna have a discussion about this estimate and see how the group feels about it without revealing what our actual numbers were, by the way. But we can see that as we get closer and closer, our range gets narrower and narrower, so we can see we've, we're hovering around 6.5 or six hours in this case. Now, I told myself that when I was going to start talking about estimating, I wanted to keep the math simple because when I look at the formulas for statistics, it's all Greek to me because it's all upsets and oopsalons and all those right there, and it's just really confusing to look at math. However, no good estimating or probability talk wouldn't be complete without talking about Bayes' theorem. Has anyone heard of Bayes' theorem before? It's really popular in um, artificial intelligence engines as well because uh, what Bayes' theorem shows is the probability of A or B happening is equal to the probability of B or A happening times the probability of A over the probability of B. Anyone in here really into math and can see what's going on here? I don't think so. What this is really saying right here is that when we get new information, our level of uncertainty will decrease, so we need to re-estimate right here. We need to reevaluate where we're going inside of it. This is showing there's a direct relationship to when we actually go ahead and start off with our data and we start getting more information inside of it. So that's where Bayes' theorem comes from. Now once we have all of our estimates, some of the things we've got to start doing is now working on our priorities on when things are going to get done. Now, how many people follow high, medium, and low priority? I'm sure most of us do inside here. but. Does anyone, can anyone tell me how many are high, low, medium priorities? If we let our product owners decide what that's going to be, 80% of, of our tasks are gonna be high. How many of you see that all the time? I probably see it everywhere. And then we'll have like two or three that are low and maybe if we're lucky, one that's a medium priority. This leads to impracticality in our estimate because everyone wants to get everything done and we're all competing for it. There's a couple of ways that we can reduce the uh, bias in terms of creating priorities inside of it. The first one, which is really simple, is the urgency matrix. Basically what we do is we divide up uh, our priorities, high, medium, and low, into this matrix of important, unimportant, versus urgent, and not urgent. 
And then we can see, okay, feature A, is it urgent? Yes, is it, then it has to be important at this point. Feature B, is it urgent? No, okay, is it important? Yes, so then that would be a medium priority inside of it, and then we can go ahead and do it. This is a really simple way of doing it. Uh, this one is really advanced, and it's the ultimate way to reduce uncertainty. The QR code has a link, and the link is down here as well, too. I'll have my slides provided um, on joined in at the end as well, too, so you can actually pull this up. Basically, what this is doing is taking uh, the product owners are going to fill in the relative benefit and relative penalty on a scale of 1 to 10, and then the developers are going to come through and put in their dev cost, 1 through 10, and the development risk on a scale of 1 to 10 where um, in this case, uh, nine for the, penalty, for the benefit on the owner's side is very valuable to the company, whereas nine for the developer means, okay, this is a very serious impact inside of it. Um, it's really complex, but it works on taking the value plus the cost percent, dividing by the risk percentage, and then we get this priority listed by uh, descending, as you can see here, and then we get our list. So in this case, for our contact form that we had before, our connected service is a low priority because it's got a higher risk associated with it. The last uh, few points I want to bring up is the politics of estimating. So when we uh, come up with an estimate right inside, uh, we'll see that people may not like what we come up with our estimate. Uh, we may say, well, it's going to take a really long time for us to do, and then we'll not get it done inside. One of the things we can do is remove people from the problem. When you look at just numbers, they don't lie. If you say it's gonna take between 200 and 500 hours and that doesn't fit the budget, you can prove it to them and I'll, I'll, after the presentation, I'll pull up a little Excel sheet that we can go ahead and use to do it. This way you can say, well listen, if you really want this, you're either gonna to have to divert more funds or whatever to get through it. Um, another thing is once we have our priorities done, we have our list done and our deadlines met. Let's say we have a deadline of August 3rd, but we really need to have everything done by July 22nd for a trade show. Well, at that point, there's no way that we can get it done. You can't fit five pounds of sugar in a three pound bag. However, with a three pound bag, you can move six pounds of sugar. You just have to iterate through it. So really talk with your team, talk with your managers, find out what is needed for, let's say, the trade show or for the deadline so that this way you can get the minimal I want to say minimal viable product, but let's say the minimal amount of features in there that will make everything work. So you can present at a trade show, you can have an open beta, and then after that, finish up with your estimates inside of it. And lastly, don't negotiate your estimate. This is the number one way that you can have a manager not believe you when you come up with an estimate. And at this point, what's going to happen is you tell them, oh, it's going to take this amount of time, and they'll say, oh, well, I don't believe you because most of the time you guys are just lying or over padding or over budgeting. Don't negotiate the estimate at all. Remember, we're the owners of the code. We're gonna know what's right for the product, for the technical side of it. Our business managers don't. They have probably no sales or management or accounting or whatever. Imagine this, if you go to a doctor and the doctor has to operate on you, and you see you're on the operating table right now and the doctor's in there washing his hands. You go to the doctor, hey, stop washing your hands and come in here and cut me open. The doctor's gonna laugh at you and say, no, I'm gonna wash my hands because he knows what's best for you. So we know what's best for the code. We have to take ownership of our code. And some final points. Um, I prefer estimating in hours. I find hours are easier to scale than in a day than days scale in a week. No one really wants to work on a weekend, but every now and then if you need to work an extra hour or so in a day, you can. Throwing more people at the problem won't solve the problem. It takes nine months to make a baby. Nine women cannot make a baby in one month. It doesn't work like that. It's very important. And I always, like to be, uh, I always like to iterate my estimates and be honest. When I find something that is wrong with the estimate, I will present it right away and say, okay, we found a snag in the FUBAR REST service, let's say, where it's not accepting our connection parameters. This is actually a true story that I had. And we could not get it working, so we actually had to drop the feature and use another option. I presented three other options that were viable, that we can get done in time, and we managed to get that, and we spent an extra two months working with the service provider to try to figure out why it wasn't working, and they told me that, oh, well, you have to use .NET instead of PHP, which that was kind of fun. Uh, as promised, I said I would have a couple of other references in here. This is Software Requirements 2 by Carl Wiegers. Um, this is where I got that list from, the ambiguity list of the requirement spells. He has a little bit more details inside of it. This book is more geared towards project managers, but it does help you with uh, gathering requirements through each phase of the SDLC, the software development lifecycle. Uh, the QR code is linked to it, and there's the ISBN down there. 
Uh, the next book that I talk about is Software Estimation. This is by Steve McConnell. Um, we've seen a couple of other books in terms of coding as well. And he goes into um, more of a business-related type of estimating. He talks about different groups, different sizes, and what tools are best to use it inside right there. And finally, the last book, this book is my absolute favorite, How to Measure Anything by Douglas W. Hubbard. This doesn't just talk about software estimation, this talks about estimating everything. And uh, he talks everything in terms of Excel, so you don't have to worry about the math or the formulas. He does show it to you, but he also shows you how you can do all these complex statistical formulas inside. And he goes into some more uh, details on in terms of estimating and coming up with predictions as well. So uh, I'll open up. Does anyone have any questions? Can you put up the previous slide, please? Sorry? Can you put up the previous slide? Okay, um, I just want to know if you have some feedback with uh, the EBS algorithm evidence-based scheduling from uh, Fogbug uh, to Bug Tracker, uh, it's developed by uh, Fog Creek uh, software. Um, um, there's a lot of different tools out there that can be used. So the question is, have I had any experience? It was EPS from a specific vendor inside of it. Um, the ones I've used Kokomo 2 in the past, which is a, a really complex one um, that will actually aggregate all the information for you automatically, but it's a paid service as well. So I was sort of implementing my own by using GitHub and just using the API to pull in the information. Um, I haven't really used any of the other tools aside from rolling out my own and just coming down with it inside. Um, I find it to be easier. It was less cost effective, more cost effective, I should say, because I didn't have to pay for a subscription service and have complex software that I didn't really know what it was doing in the background inside of it. I had more control over it. Okay. Yes. Um, hey, Tim, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, as, as a team um, gets more exper experience working together, their estimate became uh, more and more precise. But how do you handle when you have um, a new guy in the team? Um, do, you, do you make him estimate as soon as he joins the team, or do you think it's, it's better for the team estimations to have him wait and um, learn how the, the team usually um, estimates? How do you handle when the new guys come to the team? So when, uh, when new people come on, um, I always encourage them to be a part of the estimating as well, and I'll try to guide them and mentor them. Uh, it depends on the size of the team, but most of the time I start off with the absurdity test and the equivalent bet, and then I'll guide them and mentor them, because sometimes I'll actually have the estimate inside my head that's a little bit more precise than them, and I'll try to gear them to get into that right direction so they can see what they need to do to improve upon their skills. That's one of the things I encourage, is always try to expand and develop your skills inside of it. So we'll bring him on right away and start having him estimating it. Uh, the story I told at the beginning of the presentation, he was actually a new developer. He'd only been developing for about seven months beforehand. I needed him because he had a very strong math background. So he actually was able to come up with very accurate estimates very easily with guidance and help from me and the rest of the team inside of it. So I always encourage that you bring him on. Um, depending on the size of your team, it might be best to do a wide band Delphi because that encourages having that conversation after each round of estimating inside of it. If you have a smaller team, try to stick with absurdity, equivalent bets, if it's just you and someone else inside. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, yes. Hi. Oh, hi. Uh, you, you explained that you, you do uh, requirement gathering before estimates, mm -hmm. but you do not talk about uh, listing all tasks from uh, requirement. Uh, is it uh, how you do this? Or uh, do you say, I have a requirement? What it implies in, term of t in terms of uh, tasks before uh, estimating? Uh, well, if, if you notice, I did kind of list out some of the things. I said it had to be UTF-8, what the character ranges were for different things, uh, just for brevity's sake inside of it. But normally you do want to break it down into, okay, 
I know putting in a form field of 300 characters is going to take me 10 minutes to work on inside, 10 to 20 minutes inside of it. So I'll break it down and estimate for each of those smaller task features inside of it. Um, for the sake of the presentation, I didn't go into full requirements because my requirements can be 50 to 100 pages long in some cases. In other cases, it could just be an Excel sheet. It depends on what the client wants. As a freelancer, you sort of have to gauge to what they want inside. Um, when I have something in an Excel sheet, it's nice because then I can come up with formulas and graphs and show them, okay, this is what we're looking at our timeline. Some of the higher project management ones, um, they'll actually incorporate all that into you so you can see your velocity if you're doing Agile or uh, where you are in terms of the project percentage inside of it. But yeah, I normally break down every task individually and put my estimate on each requirement and each task as well. And where do you think we do the most of, of our estimation mistakes? Is it in a gathering requirement or estimating them? Um, it's normally a fair balance between gathering the requirements and estimating. The more you estimate, the quicker things will become. For instance, um, does anyone here work with like WordPress or Symfony or any of those frameworks? You'll know that it takes you, um, the more you use it, the faster you get at doing something and getting something up and running. So if I need to set up a basic WordPress site, I know I can get that done in about a day's of work, between eight and 10 hours at work, the max inside of it, because I just have so much experience inside of it. So I'll have a little bit of a less requirement on the technical side of a WordPress, because I'll know, okay, you're gonna need this server, this amount of users to support inside, and I'll be able to scale that up that way. It, that's also based on my historical data as well. But the more you estimate, the quicker and more precise you'll become inside of it. And that's sort of where the repetition aspect of it comes in. You normally want to go back in an hour and try to re-estimate again. Did I answer your question for you? Uh, just want to know, at what point do you actually start um, giving an estimate? Um, you need to have some first input, at least. Um, well, I've had, uh, I've had demands for my, for my boss, saying, okay, we need to put up a website, how much do you think it will take, how much time do you think it will take? So I told him three months. Mm -hmm. Because it was a stupid answer, as was his question, because I didn't know anything about the site he wanted to put on. So you need to get a, um, at least some input at first, and at what, at what point do you think you can start giving some serious estimates and not just fucking around with it. <laughs> um, normally when I meet a potential client or a lead, um, I'll spend uh, one meeting with them about two to three hours coming up with the scope of what needs to go on. And then I'll say, okay, I'll get back to you in about two days after I do some preliminary estimating inside of it. And normally I, come, I present it to them then. Uh, that gives me some time if I have any feed, any questions the next two days. I can say, oh, well, I just found this with this service right here. It's not gonna work. What would we like to do? What are our different options inside of it? It really depends on the amount of work inside. Um, in that case, with the example you just cited where your boss came down and said, I need a website. Well, there's lots of websites out there. What's it gonna cost? If someone came to, if, try to put it back in his perspective as well too. So why not try to ask him, well, how long is it gonna take you to build a car? Well, there's many types of cars out there with many different features inside of it. You need to narrow this down in order to get an idea of how long it's going to take inside. Uh, the range of the budget and scope and all that. And you tell him it's for his benefit because if you're over or underestimating, then you're gonna lead to overruns, you're gonna lead to waste, and you don't wanna waste company money, you wanna put the interest of the company aside from his personal goals to try and deliver something in time. Most of the time when I see something like that, uh, it tells me that they're trying to impress someone higher up than them, but I would say no, for the benefit of the company, I need time to get this data, I need time to be able to tell you how long it's going to take. Remember, we own the code, we know what it's going to take inside of it. So you, I, I don't want to say, you know, stand up and tell him he's an idiot, but you got to sort of work with him to reach the goal of bettering the company inside or bettering the project. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Thanks for your presentation. I want to ask, in fact, when you develop a software, very often um, the client asks you to change. I'm sorry, can you repeat? Um, very often, mm -hmm. uh, the requirement change. So it's, it's very hard, in fact, to, 
to estimate uh, how many time it's going to take to change something. Okay, because so um, you're, you're talking about how to deal with scope creep or feature creep? Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of different ways of doing it. Um, I find there are many clients that do it very differently in terms of how they handle scope creep or feature creep. Uh, one company I worked with, there was the end all project manager that said what we were going to do. And if we didn't have uh, his approval, we weren't going to do it inside. And then, of course, when he came in and said, okay, we, def we definitely need to make this change for whatever reason, it, it's a, probably a valid reason on why the scope or feature has to be added inside of it. And then I would say, okay, well, here's what's going to happen. We're going to push everything else back, which is very important to distinguish that, yeah, feature A, B, and C, now you want to add D and have us work on priority D all the time. A, B, and C are going to be pushed back for as long as it's going to take to do this. So it shows the consequence of the scope creep inside. Uh, another place I worked at, they had an SLA, or a service level agreement, that actually said, if you're going to make a change in the middle of a dev cycle, you're not getting it in this dev cycle if it's within a certain number of days of starting the dev cycle. So dev, our, our dev cycle was like five days, and then we have five days of testing, and then five days and five days of testing. If you came in on day three with another feature, you had to wait two weeks to get it in there because we had everything locked in in terms of code freezes and stuff like that. And having them actually sign the SLA as a contract, and you can point to it and say, no, this is where we go wrong inside of it. So it's, it's also important, remember, you have to reiterate your estimate right there. You're going to push things back, delay progress. This way, it shows the consequence. This is really what you want to try to do. Uh, hi again. Hello. Um, can you tell, uh, tell us a few more words about how you, me uh, you measure the spend time of your team? and uh, how you use it to, as a feedback for your upcoming uh, estimation. Okay, so the question is what tools do I use and how do I work with the team? Tools, methodology, uh, how you do it? Um, I wish I could, I don't have it on uh, this laptop. Uh, I have it on my old laptop, the program that I basically wrote to connect to the GitHub API. I'm actually trying to work on something that will talk to the GitHub API, so this way we can pull it down inside and then you can actually see the graphs and your progress and your velocity inside of it. So you can see your feature points, your product points, and all that. The problem is, of course, there's many different languages out there, so how do I break it down and make it sort of language agnostic is what I'm working on. Um, it's a custom-built program that I did inside of PHP. And what was great with it, it actually showed the feedback to the developers right away so they can see, oh, even though I have an eight-hour workday, I'm really only productive between five and six hours of that day. I have an hour lunch, and then the extra hour is breaks, meetings, whatever. So that actually helped with deadline um, estimating as well. So if we knew we had 500 hours, sorry, if we knew we had 500 hours or so of work to do, we knew how much, how many weeks that would take to it, and then we could say, okay, we can deliver by this date for all of that side. Um, some of the other tools I've used is um, Axelsoft's um, software on time, which is really good if you're an agile team. They basically do Scrum. I was recently presented in that show Silicon Valley on HBO. If anyone saw it. Uh, they have burn down graphs and you can see inside it will actually tell you what your estimate was, how much time you have list left in your estimate, and then it will actually tell you your actual numbers as well too, so you can see if you are on spot inside of it. Uh, but even simple Bugzilla will work or Fabricator will work as well. You can just go ahead, list everything inside of it, put an estimate, and then uh, basic time tracking inside of it. Um, Harvest is another tool I use, uh, but that's more of a business tool for tracking time. Uh, it's, uh, it's got a couple of browser plugins, so I just click on Harvest, the timer will start, and I'll stop it when I'm not doing work, and it's really more for tracking time with my clients inside and just getting an idea in terms of cost. So those are some of the tools that I've worked with. Une dernière question? Do we have some time? Um, I asked for the last question. Because I can, I can actually show just the simple thing we could do inside of Excel if you. you sure? Oh, go ahead. Okay. Sure. Mine was a bit off topic, so. Okay. Uh, so let's just go ahead and uh, just duplicate here. And if we open up Excel, um, close it here. So let's say we do a quick estimate since we have a couple of minutes here. Uh, we can say uh, uh, dev cost and amount. And this is what's known as a Monte Carlo simulation. 
inside. Uh, so what we can do here then is uh, scenario, and we just do one, two, three. And where's my mouse? What we can do here is just pull this down. And this is a very handy tool. Uh, we'll just do 10 runs inside. We can set our uh, hours cost. So we'll say it's 60. Uh, we can put in our budget. We can put in our high and our low. This is a really handy tool to say. So let's say it's 500 high, 200 low. All right? Now we'll just name that high and low. Uh, let's say our budget is 10,000. What just happened? There we go. Our budget is 10,000. So these are some handy tools you can do just inside of Excel as well. Budget. And then we'll also be dev. And then inside here, there's a function called ran between. All right, and we can say high, uh, we can say low. equals rand between oops and we'd say low high and then we can multiply that by our hour oops our dev cost inside right so very simple in here and then we'll just go ahead and we'll drag this all down so it fills in here all right, and if we just do some quick formatting on numbers. Well, we can easily see inside that if our com if we come up with our range. Oh, let me try to make that a little bigger here. Oops. So we went in the back and see. You can easily see that we just came up with a very simple budget analysis inside. If we have ten thousand dollars to work with, it costs us sixty dollars an hour to budget. Our estimate is five hundred to two hundred. We know that this is a very crazy cost for us to do, we won't be able to complete this project. This is what's known as a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, so you can just very quickly come up with a bunch of different scenarios for your ranges inside of it. And you can present this to your managers as well, if you want to see that. So that's that. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, Uh, joined in is 11.22.9, feedback as well too, and uh, you can always reach me on Twitter at Manchuk, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you.